Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is Zess and I make Rampai minigame tutorials. As usual, I would like to take a moment to thank all of my Patreon supporters who are supporting my channel and my work. It is very helpful and also very appreciated, so thank you so much. In this tutorial, we're going to look at how to make a classic plumbing minigame or pipe connecting game in Vampire. The goal with the minigame is to connect pipes from a starting point to an end point so that liquid can pass through. To do this, we'll take help of a grid display wall where we can place each pipe as an image button that we can click on in order to rotate. Once a valid connection has been made, the minigame ends and we can do whatever appropriate action we want, such as showing a screen or jumping to a label for example. And that's the basics of how the minigame works. This is going to be a little more advanced tutorial than some of the previous ones as it requires more code and a bit more math than usual. But no worries, I'll get you through what each section of code does and we'll visualize some of it in the video to make it easier to understand. To follow along with the tutorial, you're going to need a fresh Vampire project in the size 9020 times 1080 pixels using the latest version of the Vampire engine. You're also going to need the image assets, which you can download from the description box below. This tutorial is aimed towards those who already have a basic understanding of how to use Vampire and want to learn how to extend the visual novels by coding a fun minigame. As such, if you don't have the basic knowledge yet, then you're going to want to start with that first. It is also good if you have at least some basic Python programming knowledge, as we're going to be coding a bit in Python, but you might still find the tutorial interesting and useful either way. The script for this tutorial is available to download by my patrons in the tier Scripter or higher, but there will also be an extended version of the script available in the Magician tier, which I will talk more about later as we get into the video. With that said, let's get started. Here I have the main script file open in the Atom editor, and before we get into the coding, make sure you have placed all of the image assets into the images folder of your project, so you can refer to them in the code. If we have a quick look at these images, we can see what types of pipes we have available for the game. These are a straight, a curved, a T, and a cross pipe, and these have different number of endpoints in different directions. Now we're going to start by having a look at the necessary global variables we'll need for the minigame's functionality, which are defined above the start label using the default statement. All values for these variables will be needed in different places of the script file, such as in Python functions. So instead of having to remember the values and what they are for, we instead use these variables, which we refer to by name. The first two variables are called pipe rows and pipe columns and should refer to values that represent how many rows and columns you want in your grid. The two values multiplied with each other will be how many pipes should be present in the game. In this case, I have decided to have four rows and four columns for a grid of 16 cells. Therefore, the next variable, named amount of pipes, simply refers to the resulting value of the multiplication. Next, we have grid path, which is a list variable that will be filled later on in the script with values representing each cell in the grid. These cells will be a part of a complete path that is one acceptable solution to the puzzle. Then we have the variable named pipes, which will also be filled later on in the script with information about each pipe in the grid. This will be things like what shape the pipe has, what image it should use, and its current rotation. The pipe types variable is a dictionary, which should be filled with all the different types of pipes that we have. They should be paired with tuples containing the different sides that each pipe can connect with, which I'll also refer to as their endpoints. In the image for the straight pipe, for example, we can see that the endpoints are top and bottom, which means we will create a tuple with the values top and bottom and pair that with the key straight. The last variable is called connected pipes and will keep track of all the pipes that have been connected from the starting point. This will also be filled later on as the player is connecting pipes. Now let's have a look inside of the start label. Here we can see that the game starts with a function call to a function named setupPipeGame. This function helps to set up the minigame before it launches and should always be called before you show the screen containing the minigame. Let's have a look at this function next. This function is at the top of the script instead of an init Python block, together with all the other Python functions of this minigame. This function you can call when you want to set up the minigame to launch for the first time or to reset it so that the player can play it again. Inside the function, we start by making sure that the pipes and connected pipes list are reset back to the default values, which are empty lists. Since we're changing the values inside of this function, we need to declare them as global, which we do at the top of the function. 
Now we want to generate a path that will be one way for the player to solve the puzzle. For this, we have another custom function called generate grid path that we make a call to underneath. After we have generated a path, we then create pipes for the grid to use by calling a function named create pipes. Let's have a look at the generate grid path function first. This function, as I mentioned before, creates a path in the grid that the player could take in order to connect pipes from the starting point to the end point. We need to generate at least one valid path to make sure there's at least one way to solve the puzzle. If we were to just randomize a pipe into every cell of the grid and hope for the best, then the player might face a puzzle that can't be solved, which we of course don't want. Each cell that is a part of the path will be added to the grid path list, which I showed you earlier. So to make it, we first need to decide on some rules. Where does it start and end, and in which direction could it potentially go to reach the end cell from the starting cell? For this tutorial, the path will start at the first cell and end at the last cell. Knowing that, we can also decide that the path should only be able to move down and to the right within the scope of the grid. For this, we can use a for loop and let it run as many times we need to get a complete path. For every run of the loop, Rempa will then choose at random which cell to add to the path as long as it conforms to the rules. We also need to make sure Rempa never tries to continue the path to the right if the last cell so far was in the last column because in such case, we can only allow the path to continue down. Since the grid has four rows and four columns in this case, and the path can only go down and to the right, we know that the path would only ever consist of seven cells. To calculate this in code, we can add rows and columns together and subtract one. In this case, it would be four plus four minus one, which is seven. So in the for loop in our function, we can therefore write that it should run pipe columns plus pipe rows minus one times. But because we use the range function to specify how many times the loop should run, we need to also subtract one from that in order for it to run seven times, which is why it says minus two instead of one. Now we need to start coding in the rules for making a path. Since we know the first cell in the path is going to be the first one in the grid, we'll go ahead and add it first outside of the loop. Now inside the loop, we can check where the last cell in the list is placed in the grid and let Rampai decide from there which cell to add next. So in the first if statement here, we're checking if the previous cell in the path is in the last column and above the last row. Because if this is true, then the next cell in the path could only go downwards according to the rules. So in this if statement block, we then add the cell below. In case you're wondering, the modulo operator will divide one value with the other and then tell us how many remainders there are left from the division. So if we divide a number representing a cell in the last column, with the amount of columns that we have, we will get the value zero. So if the last cell in the path happened to be four and we divide this number by four, we get zero remainders. And this is how we know that this cell is indeed in the last column. Now we also want to check for other scenarios. So next we have an elif statement in the same indentation as the if statement above. This elif statement checks instead if the last cell in the path is before the last column and above the last row. Because if this is true, then the next cell could be to the right or below. In such case, we then remember the side on one of these by using the choice function and supply with a list of values it can choose from. Then we check which one Rempai chose and then add the correct cell to the path accordingly. If the last cell was one and the next cell was chosen to be the right one, then we of course want to add the number two to the path as well. To determine what this value actually is, we will grab the last item in the list and then add one to it to get the cell to the right. The last elif statement checks if the previous cell was in the last row instead. If that's the case, we can't move down anymore and only to the right, so we add the next cell to the right to the list. Here's an example of what the grid path list might look like after this function has run. If we visualize this path in the grid, we can see that it looks like this. Now I also have an extended version of this script on my Patreon where the path can also move upwards. This will make the game a little more challenging to play as the path will generally become longer. So that's something to keep in mind for later in case you want to add an extra bit of difficulty for your players. A link to both the complete script for this tutorial and the extended script is in the description box below. Now that we know how to make a grid path, let's continue by having a look at the create pipes function. So in this function, we will fill the pipes list with pipes according to the path. 
each pipe in the path needs to be of a certain type for a connection to be able to be made. But in every other cell, there also needs to be pipes, any of those we generate random ones instead. Because the path will only move down and to the right, we can only use curved and straight pipes to fill it. That's because the path will never cross itself, and therefore any other types of pipes wouldn't fit as they would leave loose endpoints. But the other cells, not part of the path, can still use any of the other types as well. Since the player could technically make a path outside of the generated path, these other pipes in the other cells could come in handy too. Generally, the larger the grid is, the larger the chance is that the player could use an alternate path. So to fill the pipes list with pipes, we use a for loop again. As such, we set the loop to run from 1 to amount of pipes plus 1. That means that the i variable will start at 1 this time instead of 0 and end in 16 plus 1, which is 17. In order to know what kind of pipe should go in which cell, we first need to know which of the cells in the grid belong to the path. We know that the first cell definitely belongs to the path, so we can create an if statement that checks if this is the first run of the loop. And if it is, then we can begin checking what kind of pipe to put in the cell. The shape of the pipe is determined by which cell came before and which comes after. If the second cell in the path is to the right, then naturally we would need a straight pipe here for it to be connected to the starting point to the left, and to the second pipe to the right. So in the next if statement, inside, we check if the following cell in the path is equal to the first one plus one. If this is true, then that means that the next cell is the second one in the grid. Then we call a function called create pipe this time, instead of create pipes, which will create an individual pipe according to the information we give it. Here we have two parameters. The first one is called type and should be equal to the type of pipe you want to create. The second one, called cell, should identify which cell this pipe belongs to. Since we determined earlier that this cell needs a straight pipe, we set the type parameter to straight. Then the cell it is in is in this case the same as the i variable, which will be 1. Therefore we say that it is equal to the i variable's value. But the cell could be below instead of to the right. So in the elif statement below, we check just that. If the current cell in the grid path list plus pipe columns is equal to the next cell in the path, then it resides below. In this case, the pipe needs to be curved instead because the left side of the pipe needs to be connected to the starting point and the second pipe needs to be connected to it from below. So we call the create pipe function and tell it to make a curved pipe. Now that we have that done, we continue by checking the rest of the cells in the path. In this following elif statement, which is in the same annotation as the first if statement, we check if the current run of the loop is instead more than one and if it's less than amount of pipes. If it is, then we're now going to be looking at cells between the first and last one in the grid. Then inside of him, we check if the value for the i variable is in the grid path list. So let's say that this is the third run of the loop, then we'll be checking if 3 exists in the list. If it does, then that means that the third cell is in the path and we need to create a specific pipe for it. So in that case, we continue in a similar way to what we did with the first cell. This time, it will be useful to us to know in which index position the current, previous and next cell values are located in the list. Let's say that the grid path list looks like this. The current loop is on the fourth item in the list, which is the value 7. Here we want to know which value in the list is before 7 and which is after. To grab these values, we first determine in which index position the current cell is in the list, so for that we create a variable called current cell index and set it to be equal to the index position of the i variable in the grid path list. The index method will find the value that we're looking for in the list and return its index position. In this case, it will return 3 as the value 7 is the fourth item in the list. Now that we have that, we can check which value comes before and after. For that, we create two more variables called next cell index and pref cell index. The next cell index variable is set to current cell index plus 1, which in this example will be 4 because 3 plus 1 is 4. The pref cell index variable is set to current cell index minus 1, which will be 2. Now that we know where these values reside in the list, we can go ahead and check what kind of pipe we can create in the current cell. We know that if the current cell in the path is in the last column, it could only continue downwards. It can't continue to the right, because to the right is the first cell of the next row. We only need to know if the previous cell was to the left or above, because that will change whether we need a straight or curved pipe in the current cell. If the cell is in the first row in the last column, however, we don't want to check if the previous cell was above because there is no more cells above. In this case, the previous cell could only have been to the left. 
If the cell resides anywhere in the last row, we also know that the next cell can't possibly be below, but only to the right. So we just need to know if the previous cell was above or to the left. If the cell is however in the first column of the last row, we don't need to check if the previous cell was to the right, because it could only have been the one above. If the current cell is between the first and last row, and between the first and last column, so anywhere here, the previous cell could be above or to the left, and the next cell could be to the right or below. Now that we know that, we can start coding the if statements that will check these conditions. For that, we first have an if statement that checks if the cell in the path at the current cell index position is in the first column. If it is, then it must be in any of these cells in the grid, because in the previous check we did, we know it can't be in the first cell of the grid. So then we check if the next cell is either to the right or below. If the next cell is to the right, then we set the pipe to be curved, and if it's above, we set it to be straight. Now we also need to check for the other scenarios. So below here, we have an elif statement that checks if the current cell is instead the last cell in row 1. If so, the previous cell could only have been to the right, and we know that we can only continue downwards in the last column, so the only possible pipe tab here will be a curved one. Next, we check if the current cell is the last cell in any row except the last one. If it is, then we check if the previous cell was above or below, and then add the appropriate type accordingly. Next, we have an else statement that will be true if none of the previous if statements were true. That means that the current cell is between the first and last cell in this row, so it could be in any of these cells. To narrow it down further, we also check inside this else statement block if the current cell is in the first row, because if it is, then the previous cell could only be to the left and not above. Now that we know that, we can go ahead and check if the next cell is to the right or below and create a pipe type accordingly. But if the cell is in the last row instead, then the next cell can only be to the right. The previous cell could be above or to the left, so we go ahead and check that next. If the previous cell was above, then this cell needs a curved pipe, and if it's to the left, then it needs a straight pipe. Then we have an else statement that would be true if the elif and if statement above are false. If that is true, then the current cell is between the first and last row, and between the first and last columns. For any of these cells, the previous cell could be above or to the left, and the next cell could be to the right or below. So inside this else statement block, we go ahead and check like before. First, we see if the previous cell was to the left, and if it is, we then check if the next cell is below or to the right. If it is to the right, we need a straight pipe, and if it's below, we need a curved pipe. If the previous cell was instead above, then if the next cell is to the right, we need a curved pipe, and if it's below, we need a straight pipe. And that's all the checks we need to create pipes that belong to the path. Now we just need to create random pipes for all the other cells. This we do by creating an else statement that is in the same annotation as the if statement that checked if the i variable's value exists in the grid path list. Because if that is not true, then that means that this cell is not in the path. So inside this else statement block, we create a random pipe type by using the choice function within RenPy. We want RenPy to pick a random pipe type from the keys inside the pipe types dictionary, so for that we first grab all the keys from it by using the keys method on it, and then we specify we want to turn this into a list. So now the choice function can use this list to pick a random value. Then we create a pipe like normal, but specify that the pipe type should be the randomly picked value. Now we have covered almost all scenarios. The only thing left is to add the last pipe in the grid. So we create an elif statement, which is in the same annotation as the elif statement that checks if i is more than 1 and less than amount of pipes. So if that is not true, then that means that this could be the very last one of the loop. So with this elif statement, we check if i is equal to amount of pipes. If it is, then we do the same checks as before. We create the current cell index variable again, since the previous one we made only exists inside the last elif statements block. Then we check if the previous cell was to the left or above, and since the ending point for the last pipe to connect to is to the right, we create a pipe type accordingly. Now there's been quite a bit of code so far, so I hope that you've been able to follow along with what has happened, but if you find it to be a bit confusing, it's okay to take a break and then go back to different sections of the video to see if you can make more sense of it. But with that said, that's all for the create pipes function. Now let's have a look at the create pipe function that we have used throughout to create individual pipes.